Was Abraham righteous? That's what we're going to talk about today in Romans 4. So we started out Romans with Paul giving a big discussion about who who doesn't need grace. It, it, the, the Jews who have the law, do they need grace? Yes. They have fallen short of the law. The Gentiles who never lived under the law, maybe don't even know what the law is. Yep. First of all, very apparent in the world what the law is. But secondly, also have fallen short. In the end, everybody needs the grace of God. Everybody, everybody. So now what we're going to find is Paul continuing on to talk about, in this case, Abraham. Now, Abraham is going to be someone big to the Jewish people. You know, we think of him, I think, in Christianity is, oh, Abraham, a father, patriarch in the Old Testament. But he is really the original guy who came and was faithful to God in, I don't know, the face of really interesting things that you're called out of this land. Your father probably was successful. I think he um, made idols. He was happy in his home. He was elderly. He has a wife. And it just goes on from there. So we're going to talk a little bit about what Paul has to say about Abraham. Do we gain anything? Because Abraham came before us. If Abraham was justified by words, he would have something to boast about. But instead, it's because of God. The scripture says that Abraham believed in God and it was counted to him as a righteousness. It's, again, not about works. It's not about the things Abraham did. What if Abraham believed in God, believed that God came to save his soul, justify his sins, even back then, but says, you know what? I really don't feel like moving. Well, God's will was for him to move, but that doesn't mean that's what made him righteous. That just made him obedient, dutiful, living the kind of life that God called him to live. If we're supposed to work, and wages are not like a gift from our employers to us, but instead something we earned to get. But let's say that you have someone who doesn't work, believes in him who justifies the ungodly. That's, that's Jesus. That's God. He is the one who unjustifies the godly. His faith is counted as righteousness, even if he doesn't do the things. Just as David also speaks of blessings of whom God counts righteousness apart from works. So I thought it was confusing before to say, that works in the way that Paul said it, because it made people believe that works is what earned your way to heaven. And it was so detrimental, I think, in the beginning of the church, in the Middle Ages, where you say, well, if you want to be saved, you're going to go do this thing I want you to do, because that is what God told me you should do, and you should go and save me. And God is saying, it's not works. We're lawless. Our sins are covered. And they're sinned because Jesus was sent to cover our sins. And he quotes Psalm 32, 1, to say our sins are covered. Again, not a New Testament thing only. This was from the very beginning. And it's because the Lord is not going to count his sins against us. So it's like we went into a court trial and the judge looked at all the counts and says, count one, not counting it towards you. Count two, not counting that against you. They're just being thrown out there right in court. Why? Because Jesus said, I'm going to pay the debt. It's forgiven. It's over with. Totally done. And so is this a blessing, he says, for the circumcised or the uncircumcised? Again, he were going back to that theme. Faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. He believed in God and he believed in what God was going to do. So he received circumcision, which I think many men in particular would probably not vote for as a sign. But it was a sign that he had faith in God even before he was circumcised. So basically, it's that part where Jesus is talking about the circumcision of the heart. This is supposed to be a sign, a covenant with God. If you don't have that circumcision of the heart, it's almost as if you were uncircumcised. And here he's saying, you know, Abraham was circumcised before he was circumcised because he believed in God. And I'm sure Abraham would have wanted to know, you mean I didn't have to do that? But anyway. So the purpose was to make him the father of all who believed without being circumcised. So righteousness would be counted to them as well. So for everybody and to make him also the father of the circumcised. So again, we're comparing the two groups because everybody needs to have that. And then they walk also in the footstep of Abraham, who was indeed circumcised. 
You know, it's funny because I like how Luke writes because it's very, very clear. I think all the gospel writers were very, very clear. You can tell that Paul is some kind of genius brain. And so when he writes, you kind of sit there for a while going, what? Can you imagine getting this letter? I mean, we're not even, uh, you know, we're about a quarter of the way through the letter. And can you imagine being in Rome and going, okay, everyone, we just read the first few paragraphs. Let's, uh, let's, let's come back tomorrow and read the rest. I'm too tired. I can't, I can't fit any more in my head, right? I mean, this is a letter, a letter of letters. So anyway, he said, that's why we depend on faith, so that the promise of grace may be on us, so we can rest in grace. And I thought this was such an interesting word, rest in grace. I, I see people, you know, who would say, well, I would become a Christian. I'd put my trust in Jesus, but I've done so much bad in my life. I, I can't turn to God now. Nope. He's telling you to turn to him. Or people say, you know, I have, I've been a Christian my whole life. I just did something horrible. God's never going to forgive me for this. And again, this, I think, too, was a message that was used in medieval times to say, mm, God's just not going to forgive you for what you just did. I'm the spoken mouthpiece of God and you went against me. So that's just not going to forgive you. And this is where it's saying it's just not true. You know, that in essence, it's not adherence to the law, but it's also to stare in the faith of Abraham. God asked Abraham, told Abraham who he was, and Abraham followed and had faith in him. Bob Guzik brought out this point that Abram was kind of a, a trick because his name meant father. But he was never a father. His wife could not have children, or they could not have children. And so God says, you know what? I'm going to give you a different name. I'm going to call you the father of many nations. Oh, man, you mean I'm finally going to get rid of this name and you just make it even worse? I am not a father of anybody. He probably wondered, what? Me? You know, I mean, right now, I'm, I wanted to have kids. It didn't happen. And, you know, and what if God comes to me and say, oh, I'm going to make you the mother of all nations? Mm, I don't know about that. But anyway, he believed in God. He followed God and he did the things that God told him to do, not because he was trying to justify his life, but because he put his trust into God. It is a credit to him. And he knew God calls all things into existence. He gives life to the dead. And so Paul says he had hope that these things would happen and, and, and would have hope that he would become the father of all nations because the God he trusted said so. Wow. So it didn't weaken his faith when he kind of considered it. So it means like he didn't stop for a moment and go, really, God, me? I mean, to be honest, if God came to me, let's say in a dream and said, Jill, you can be the mother of many nations. And I'd be like, hmm, I don't think so. This must be a weird dream. It didn't happen to Abraham. He just said, okay, well, trust in you, Lord. And it's amazing, right? It says that he was about 100 years old when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. But it says, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promises of God. And he grew strong in his faith. That, that is what makes Abraham such an incredible figure. It was not that he left his home and not that he did all the things that God told him to do. The fact he stuck to everything, that he kept his faith and it kept him strong and he understood the things that God was promising him. He goes, okay, we'll just see how that turns out. But Paul is crediting it to him and saying, because of this faith, it counted towards him as righteous. Again, not saving, but he did the things God asked him to do. So he said, it's going to be for us too. It's going to be counted to us for believing him, believed in the raised from the dead Jesus who removes us, you know, from our sins and justifies us for all of us. We can too also have the same faith of Abraham. Wow. This whole story of talking about Abraham was going to mean a lot, you know, particularly to the Jewish people. But what about the Gentiles too? Are they going to get this? And I think Paul did a good enough explanation to make people understand this was a big deal. This was a big leap for Abraham. So even if you didn't know Abraham very well, I mean, chances are you probably heard of him, right? We're how many years later and we've heard of Zeus and Apollo and Athena and all those. We've heard of them. I know we have languages and it was different, but they had oral tradition. And you heard of different stories around your area. So they would have understood just from hearing probably word of mouth, this guy was considered to be a big deal. Here's why. 
And it wasn't because of things he did, but because of, of his faith. But I really like at the end how Paul brings it and says, it'll be counted to us too. Making that story personal to us. And that ends chapter four. What I'm going to meditate on is this whole lesson on thinking about all the things Abraham did. Again, when you raise up Jewish, you hear everything Abraham did, good and bad. But you realize that wasn't the big story here. The big story was his faith in God. That is the big story. And what I'm going to pray about is to have God give me that strength to have that kind of confidence that he said we should have confidence in our salvation. We should have confidence that we'll be raised from the dead. We should have confidence in everything that God promised us. I'm going to pray for that level of confidence. And what I'm going to share with others is that they too should have that confidence that even when God says something, it makes just absolutely no sense. I mean, you talk about the world today. So wait a minute, I'm going to be raised from the dead and go to a place of eternal Eden and live lives and build things and take all the skills and the things that I became on earth, but in a purified form, live out my life forever. Mm, That's a little hard to believe. We live in an age like that, that is all about the material, the pizza that's in front of me, the very body I have right now. What I have is what I have right here, right now. That's what matters. I hope that I can share with others that boldness of faith, believing in the things that God says will be. Woo. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that I have a better life in smallsteps.com. I'll tell you that I'm kind of thinking about my podcast and thinking what they should be. And particularly the two book ones, you know, again, I read a book for each of those podcasts. And so if you have thoughts about what you would like, start with small steps or small steps with God, what you think that it would be better for you. I have a lot of ideas floating around in my head, everything from going to YouTube and doing video to making the podcast shorter, but I'd love to hear from you. I would love to hear what your ideas for those two podcasts as listeners, your opinion about that matters a great deal to me. So I appreciate it. Thank you for listening. Have a wonderful day.